हरि ओम फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द सेवेंथ पार्ट ऑफ द केस स्टडी ऑन रेवेन्यू एक्सटॉर्शन बाय द ब्रिटिश इन तिरुनल वैली डिस्ट्रिक्ट सो लेट्स मूव ऑन टू टूडेज प्रेजेंटेशन एंड आई थिंक द शॉर्ट फॉर्मेट प्रेजेंटेशन हैव बीन क्वाइट पॉपुलर सो आई स्टिक विद दैट ओके सो जस्ट अ कपल ऑफ बेसिक थिंग्स बिफोर वी काइंड ऑफ गो ऑन to the different revenue systems the british implemented and in this part it, today i will be taking up what was known as the amani system so this was the first british revenue system which kind of started off from early 1800s and went up till 1810 and so this is just a little bit of an overhang you know from the previous parts where i was giving the basics of you know the how agricultural system worked so land was classified into two different types wetland and dry land and the names are pretty self explanatory so wetland is any land that has got a water source so it can be a canal it can be a tank it can be a pond it can be a well so it should have a water source throughout the year or at least for most part of the year okay. and this is usually uh, fertile land so it can go from land which yields around 2 to 4 crops a year so very fertile land and obviously it goes through decreasing fertility but there it but because of the easy availability of water this land has definitely more value than the second classification which is dry land now dry land is a very broad spectrum so this is land which is only watered by rains so when the monsoon comes you have water otherwise you don't have water you might have wells which are which don't give that much water or which are half dry or you could have completely barren land like wasteland or it could be semi desert because in tirunel valley district some parts of the district near the coast are literally nothing but sand dunes okay so these are two broad classifications and the interesting thing about the british times was because they were looking to extract the maximum money so land was classified into many different categories known as tarams i think at one point there were 20 or 30 different categories but every category had to pay a tax so it could be one ana but they had to pay a tax and we'll move on to the first system in this part which was known as the amani system so this had a relatively short shelf life uh if we count the beginning of the british rule as 1801 in tirunelveli district so the british once they you know kind of got power were confident enough they simply shout off the nawab and this was what they did in india and everywhere else in the world so there were useful idiots who they used for their own ends and then once you know they were done they would just get rid of them so we saw in the last few parts that even before 1801 the british pretty much controlled the tax collection for almost 20 years before this period 1801 was when they kind of formally took over and this amani system was kind of a mix up between the nawab's revenue system where you know wetland was taxed but not all dry land was taxed and i think dry land paid a fixed charge and lushington system so lushington was the first um, collector now i keep mentioning this every time but the word collector means somebody who collects revenues and obviously in modern day india we still have collectors so they don't collect any revenue uh, but you know their uh, uh, attitude hasn't changed much uh, and they are still you know brown sibs so what lushington did was uh, i'm just going to have a look at my roots so all the details are in my article uh, you know which i link in every part and it's on my blog as well and the first thing the british did in any area was try and survey it as well as possible because they were always kind of uh, apprehensive that they were losing out on a big chunk of revenue so for wetlands lushington kind of did a rough guesstimate of how much uh, you know revenue was payable by the farmers and for drylands he simply used the nawab's existing classification and in 1805 he added another category to the existing four categories so to save on revenue what he did was he got farmers of one village to kind of go to the next village and then survey the lands and then estimate the revenue so that was a, so he didn't have to kind of spend a lot of money on hiring an army of peons who would go and do all the work so that was money saving because remember this was the east india company yeah, profits maximum and even the barren lands now barren lands were not 
tilled or farmed at all because every farm for example if you have got a farm of 10 acres there will be 5 or 6 acres which you are actually farming on there will be 4 acres which are left fallow for animals to graze and there might be 1 or 2 acres which are wasteland which you don't do anything okay. but even those lands were taxed so even semi desert lands were taxed at 10 annas per acre because under British rule every acre of land was assumed to be farmed so if you are 10 acres it was assumed that you are farming on 10 and you were getting you know profit or money from all 10 so the government had a right to the revenue generated from all 10 acres but obviously in reality you are only farming on 5 and you are paying tax for 10 and land was classified like I said in the previous slide into tarams or categories and you know as years went by these tarams kind of this classification and categories went on uh, increasing so you had you know multiple categories and in addition to the land tax there were you know many other taxes so I give the names of a few here and I explain them in the article so motor fa motor fa was a very nasty tax because motor fa was basically tax on implements so agriculture implements or even uh, you know the tools or you know different machines used by you know weavers craftsmen tradesmen etc so it was a very atrocious tax and it lasted for quite some time before it was taken off and then you had the nilavari desh kaval so desh kaval was the tax which was traditionally collected to maintain the village police but what the east india company did was they got rid of the village police but they kept on collecting the tax so desh kaval was a tax which was collected by paligars you know the traditional landholders okay so let's move on to the next slide <coughs> so this uh, graphic or chart shows you the amount of grain left with a farmer as a percentage of average yield now I have explained the average yield calculations in the you know research paper but typically we have taken the average yield to be 547 kilos per acre now remember there were different fertility types so very fertile maybe okay not so great and completely barren so this is kind of an average so you would have the fertile parts uh, you know yielding a lot more but this is an average so it kind of balances out so you can see for most of the period Oh, that's the mouse pointer I thought it had disappeared for a while so for most of the period the farmer wasn't really left with anything so it's a steady negative percentage and at times it kind of goes to minus 15 percent so for that 10 year period from 1801 till 1810 for most part it's actually in the negative and there's a very sharp drop in 1809 1810 so this was the part when there was a there was almost famine like conditions and they had to suspend the revenue collections for the year so you can imagine in 10 years how much stress that put on the farmer okay so this is the net income of the farmer in rupees per acre again for the 10 year period unsurprisingly if you are not left with even subsistence quantity of grain when you are paying everything in tax you won't be left with much money at all so the net income is in negative and negative income means as you can understand that the farmer was taking debt from money lenders and again I would like to point this out that the British rule was the period when these you know these blood sucking money lenders uh, from especially from Rajasthan you know when they were on the Marwadis they moved throughout India and this the British actually encouraged their settlement because they were the ones who would lend money to these farmers and the farmers kept going into a debt trap so it was a, it was a pretty you know cozy arrangement for the British but it was a, a very terrible arrangement for you know the local farmers because what used to happen previously with the native moneylenders for example in the Tirunelve district I don't know which particular jati or caste did the moneylending there used to be some flex but with the Marwadi moneylenders they were only there to take money and send the money back to Rajasthan so there was absolutely no flex and in 1877 in in Deccan you know present day Maharashtra there were pretty big riots against Marwadi and Gujarati moneylenders these are known as the Deccan riots of 1877 and there was a there was a commission report as well I think it's available on the internet archive now okay so now Ryotwari land revenue so if you remember you know earlier on I told you that land revenue was of three main classifications 
or three main types one was the rayatwari which was collected from individual farmers so this formed 80 to 82 percent of the land revenue total land revenue connected the rest 20 percent was uh, you know the revenue collected from zamindars which was known as zamindari and the third category was inamdari so inamdars were actually holders of inams or lands which were granted to them uh, tax-free lands so it might have been granted to them say during the times of the Vijayanagar emperors during the Marathas during you know the, the Muslim rule and these lands were rent free for whatever service they had rendered so no tax was applicable to them what the British did was they bought in this Inam Commission which kind of looked at all these Inams and then decided okay this is fraud this is not right this needs to be taxed so there were the Inamdars so Inamdars and Zamindars made up 20% of the land total land revenue but 80% were always these individual farmers who have been bled dry so you can see that the percentage of yield per acre being play, paid as land revenue so this kind of hovers between on an average say 40 40 to 45% on an average or maybe 30 to 40% and except for this dip in 1807-1808 it's always kind of at an high and again we need to add a lot of different taxes Motarfa, Nilavari, Deshkawal on top of this uh, plus there's no allowance for you know the costs of cultivation so if you're not sure what the costs of cultivation are uh, please refer to the or have a look at my at the previous part of the series because I've tackled the cost of cultivation so there are I don't know 11 12 or 17 types so when you add the cost of cultivation the farmer isn't really left with anything so the actual income unsurprisingly so it's jumping back a few slides it goes into the negative okay when all these costs are added on okay friends so that was it for the Amani system there's a lot more detail in my article so please um, read the article in the next part I'll take the successor to the Amani system which was the decennial lease system so that's all from me this time friends and I hope you like share and subscribe to the videos so let me just go back and stop the recording oh, there we go